I'm Matthew Hill, I'm the editor of Stamp Collector Magazine, uh, which was formerly Stamp and Coin Mark, we changed our name back in January. Um, we're over at Stamp 20, if you want to come and have a look. Um, if you sign up for our email newsletter, I'll stop the plug in a minute, um, <laughs> we'll give you a free back issue. So we're over there, all, all Stamp X. Uh, so obviously we're talking to Chris King and Frank Walton today. Um, unfortunately, Edward Kempka, who was going to be here, is uh, not doing well. Um, so we send him all our best wishes. And Chris has kind of been stood in at the last moment. We've sent him our best wishes and he's not, I got sent as the second-hand poor substitute. Well, the thing I guarantee is he won't be watching us live on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> His thumbs are too big to use a phone, aren't they? Okay, so, so uh, the two people we have here today are both uh, prestigious philatelists, uh, both former presidents of the Royal. Yeah, we're both past it. <laughs> both past it. Um, Frank, you were formerly editor of the London Philatelist. I was. Royal. Um, and you're both also signatories of the role of distinguished philatelists, and yep. you're the keeper of the role. Um, I used to be the keeper of the role. I managed to find somebody else to do it. Okay. <laughs> So, um, without flattering these guys too much, I guess they've reached a kind of pinnacle of philately. Um, so I wanted to start with kind of going back to the start of the journey. How did you first start collecting, exhibiting? Where did you start on this journey? And how did you kind of get to where you were? So, Frank, do you want to yep. kick off? I can remember it pretty vividly, really. I was um, about five or six years old, and you all have the son of your mum's best friend, who was a lot older than me, he was at least seven, right? And he was a, a real stamp collector. And I just got one of a world album, you know, stuck them all in. I have to confess, I think I did use sellotape once, like I'm sure we did when we were five ourselves, yeah? And um, Philip Holmes, this guy, I don't remember his name, isn't he? And uh, he convinced me to become a specialist. So I, I started collecting British Commonwealth instead of the whole world. At five? Yep. <laughs> and then no. Philip went off to boarding school, so that sort of didn't happen for a while. And then um, in, uh, I would have been 11, I went to my school stamp club, first term, and there was an auction. And I'll show you how uh, keen I am on actually uh, sticking to my guns. The first lot was a mixed collection of 205 Chinese stamps for a shilling. I won it at a shilling. I had to outbid somebody, but I won it. Yeah. And of course, it didn't quite fit into my album of GB and Copperwell. <laughs> so I've collected China ever since. Oh, yeah. yeah, so I've done exhibits of China, but I have to say, apart from that period of sort of 15 to 21, I've always collected stuff. Okay. Well, the rest is history. Uh, me, well, I wasn't a very gregarious child because I was very ill. Um, and being very ill and confined to bed with bronchial asthma, uh, my mother needed to find me something to do. So I learned to read at about the age of four and started collecting stamps at the age of five because my mum bought packets of stamps from Woolworths and brought them home to me. Uh, and then my grandmother, who had friends around the world for some reason, started sending me stamps that she received. And uh, I put them in my album. I can't remember what it was called, but it had a picture of London Bridge on the front. Um, and I collected and collected and collected, but I've always been a secret collector. I um, didn't join a stamp club until the 1970s, late 70s, and I didn't attend a meeting until 2001. Um, so why was that? I was trying to make a, I was trying to make a living. Okay, <laughs> that's fair enough. <laughs> but, but all the time that I've been, I collected stamps until I guess I was 15 years old. And then I stopped. I wanted to buy a four-track tape recorder. I sold all my stamps um, and bought this tape recorder. Um, and then seven years later, I was married to my wife, Peter, and um, I was bemoaning the stamps that I'd lost when I started uh, sort of meeting girls and wanting to impress them with my fancy tape recorder. And um, so she said, look, either shut up about the stamps or start collecting again. So I did. So I've collected ever since. So I've got this seven year gap. Um, but I was still a closet collector and I, um, I was quite ill again in 1989. And I started writing my stamps up for the first time. And that, I guess, was the first time that I turned into a... I began to become a philatelist. Before that, it was I wanted one of everything. 
and then I wanted one of everything from every country that had ceased to exist and then I wanted one of everything from Denmark and I gradually focused in on a smaller and smaller area and got more and more interested and then in 2005 I joined the Royal and I rather wish I joined much earlier because the best thing about Philately is the, the, the social side of things. Okay, how about you Frank, how did you get from this six year old uh, um, starting out to kind of signing the... Just the happened, I used to work for Midland Bank in Sheffield and um, there was a guy next to me who just next to me was a member of the Midland Bank Philatelic Society, which I think still existed. It was probably called ages to be seen now, but it was cool. And uh, he used to go through exchange packets at lunch times. Remember all the exchange packets, the big cardboard boxes? And I started looking over his shoulder and said, well, I've got a few of those. And uh, he said, God, I haven't got any of those, he said. So he, he basically put me on the list next to him. So I started collecting stamps that way. After about a year, I became the uh, secretary of Midland Bank Philatelic Society. And then I became Yorkshire Philatelic Association representative, for, and then I joined the West African Study Circle, um, and then I became editor of the, the Cameo, which is their specialist journal. And then the, my major break, <coughs> which broke me, <laughs> was um, I was the subject of a conversation on a tube, and I didn't quite realise what was going on. And uh, the late George Barker, who had done uh, 15, 16 years editing and the Flacklist for the Royal. Um, he decided he wanted to retire. And they actually, somebody rang me and said, would I become the editor of the Royal? This is a conversation on, uh, on the tube. And uh, I was absolutely astonished and flattered that mere little Frank from Sheffield would actually be honored to become the editor of the Royal, the Royal's Journal. And I thought, Actually, I started working it out afterwards. At the time, there were about 1,500 members of the Royal, of which about 800 in the UK. And in those days, you really had to be in the UK, so there was one in 800 chance already. Yeah? You had to be really under 60, otherwise it's not worth doing it. So that narrowed it down to about 50. <laughs> and then, really, they, that was a joke, sorry. And then, <laughs> it was nearly, much nearer 60. Nearly, nearly <laughs> a joke, yes, absolutely. And then they said, well, you think about it, you really need somebody who's had some sort of editorial experience doing a, hopefully a specialist study circle journal. So you put this together, oh sorry, being IT literate helps, I was an IT professional in a row. So you want somebody's IT literate, somebody who's British, and lives in Britain, sorry, somebody who's under 60 and somebody who's got editorial experience. And there was only who's, one. Who's a member of the Royal. <laughs> and suddenly, the quote was, there were fewer than two. <laughs> So I, I actually stopped becoming flattered. <laughs> but anyway, that was basically my big introduction into, uh, into starting really on the ladder into yes. organised uh, serious flattery. Okay. And just sticking on the Royal, um, from what I can gather, it's doing very well. Membership's um, buoyant at the moment, and you're just about to launch into a new premises. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that, Chris? I know you've been there today. Yes. Yes. Um, the Royal has been at 41 Devonshire Place since 1925, um, when I think we spent 12,700 and something pounds on a 999-year lease on a Georgian London property. Times have changed, um, and it took took them nearly five years to pay for it. Actually, six. No, 1919 to 1928, it took them nine years to pay for it. But the building was and always has been a house, essentially, and we've been trying to occupy it as the Royal, um, for as a philatelic society. And as the numbers have grown, and expectations have grown, not just because the Royal's got a museum and we've got a growing library, um, but because we're trying to make ourselves more publicly public facing outgoing. Um, we've got problems with disability access, disability, we, we had no lift, you couldn't get up the stairs, um, and we, if we were going to grow and broaden our footprint, we had to find a way of getting the Royal accessible and a way of building a proper museum in the building and expanding our library. And we've been trying to do that really from 2007 through to 2017, Frank, really. Ten years, I guess. Um, 
the society had discussed moving before, even 20 years ago, and it was seen to be too difficult. Um, but this generation, when Frank was in the chair as president, um, decided that the time had come to look for a new place to work from if we were going to move forward as a society. Because the society is, 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 is a significant international organisation. It's, it, it's got a lot of, um, it's got a very wide reach and a, a, a lot of people take a real interest in it. So we decided it was time to move. And when we have moved, after seeing 52 different buildings and discounting all but 51 of them. So we found 15 Abchurch Lane, um, which was a gentleman's club, um, with presentation rooms, um, with two basements, and we've got the library in one basement, and the, um, the library racks in another, two really good rooms for meetings, each of which will hold 110, 120 people and a top room which will hold 60, which is ideal also for board meetings um, and the first society, the Revenue Society met there last Saturday, they were the first society to use the building. So the Royal meeting tonight, the Australians, the Australians tonight. are meeting tonight. So as part of the charitable work of the society, as part of the educational work of the society and as part of the society's wish to support philately wherever it exists. Um, we have to provide good spaces to do this work in. And we have. And in a couple of weeks' time, we might even be able to say we're very nearly finished. Today, today I can only say we're nearly finished. So, um, but yeah, we, 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 we're, we're going to be very pleased with what we have. And there will be, I suspect, well over 200 people there tomorrow. Uh, Her Majesty's collection is coming tomorrow. It's the first official meeting of the Society at the new venue. Most of the buildings open. <coughs> We've got the first official meeting of the society tomorrow, and yesterday at five o'clock, I got the building control certificate allowed, which allows us to have the meeting. So it, it was. So plenty of time. To so yeah, hours. absolutely. <laughs> so it's been a bit tough, really. Um, yeah, it, it's been a much bigger job than I expected. <laughs> yes, please. Yep, and um, we're hoping that we can carry on supporting philatelic organisations meeting at the Royal at pretty much the same prices as we always have. But we are very keen on um, finding spaces for commercial organisations that hold their meetings, and uh, we'd be very pleased to hear of anybody who wants to have a board meeting, a presentation, or whatever, because we have good spaces now to do this work in. Yeah, great. Um, should we talk a bit about exhibiting stamps? Um, we both exhibited around the world. Yep. Not stamps. Crystal history, <laughs> philatelic exhibits of some sort. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, what, what advice would you give to someone who's, who's thinking of perhaps, you know, exhibiting some stamps here? Funny enough, it, it's, this may sound quirky, but if you want to exhibit, the first thing you've got to do is understand there are rules. It's like, it's no good you going to buy a brand new Ferrari if you want to drive 180 miles an hour because you're going to break the rules. So what you've got to do is understand if you do want to exhibit competitively, you've got to read the rules before you start. And if you're not prepared to follow those rules, my very, very strong advice is, don't bother. If you want to collect what you want to collect in the privacy of your own room, like Christian for 30 years, or if you want to give local displays to your local societies and make everybody wow at your eloquence and brilliance of writing, that's fantastic. Mm. But please don't expect to be able to succeed in international exhibiting if you have that mindset. You've got to start off with a, a perspective of building a competitive exhibit rather than collecting a, a subject. You can migrate from one to the other. But you, there's no way you can start. I'm going to collect Greenland, says Frank, making one up. And I suddenly go out there and buy everything I can find on Greenland. And I bet I can build a collection. Mm. Doesn't mean to say I'm going to do a nice exhibit. Mm. And you've got to have that focus of thinking how it's going to look in 80, 80 sheets or 128 sheets. And if you don't do that on day one, then I'm afraid you're probably going to fail. And do you think do you think a, a display or an exhibit over so many sheets has to 
have a, a story, a beginning, a middle and an end. You couldn't, you've absolutely got it bang on there. You are telling a story and you've got to convince the judges that you understand your story. You've got to make it sensible. You've got to have it balanced. There's no point having um, everything to do with uh, Queen Elizabeth and George V and George VI and, and have loads and loads of gaps in Edward VII and Queen Victoria. And that's really where I'm coming from. Unless you actually set off to achieve a balanced exhibit, then you will not do well competitively. And the whole thing comes down to your choice of subject. You know, unless you've got very, um, very deep pockets, there's no point in you trying to collect penny blacks to win medals internationally. Because I'm afraid you just won't do it. Somebody else has got them. Yeah. My favourite, my favourite story here, by the way. This is not true. It's a great story. The same collection has won the, the British, sorry, has won the Grand Prix in each of the last five London shows. Different owner, but the same collection. In other words, what happens is there's only so many brilliant penny blacks out there with corner margins and very large usages and not six the main examples, etc. etc. And basically, somebody buys them all at an extortionate amount of money. They exhibit it, win the Grand Prix d'Honneur in London, and then sell it. And then somebody else buys it and they build the same collection again and put it in. That isn't quite true, it's not far off. <laughs> it's not at all true, but it's, got, <laughs> but it's got a grain of truth in it. Yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's 48 years I was a closet collector, Frank, not 30 old. Um, exhibiting is not collecting at all. Um, exhibiting is not even displaying to your club at all. Uh, Peter and I, um, with some other philatelic colleagues, were judging at Hampex, which is the Leeds Hampshire Federation competition this last Sunday. And just about every exhibitor had some really good material, but just about every exhibitor needed to go back and look at the rules, and, and, and that, that is the key. I mean, my wife and I exhibited in Copenhagen in 2001, it was the second competitive exhibit that we created, and we created this one together, and we got a bronze medal. I think, we, did we get 62 points? Or did we get 60? We, we got we, It matters that too, I think. I am terribly proud of this because it's very, very hard to get such a low poor medal. <laughs> bronze medals are the rarest. Right, bronze medals are the rarest, absolutely. So I'm a, I, I did toy with the idea once of trying to get one of every colour. Um, but so it was a lot. We hadn't read the rules because we didn't know there was a Yeah, absolutely. We were making it up as we were going along. And somebody at the exhibition said, have you read the rules? And we said, no, are there rules? <laughs> um, and so at that point, we discovered that exhibiting was quite a different skill. It's the difference, not quite between the Premier League and the Saturday kick around at the park, but it's a bit like it. Um, you do actually have to be quite a lot more careful, a lot more organised, a lot more structured, a lot better storyteller. Um, and you need to be much, much better at persuading the judges that you really do know what you're talking about. This doesn't mean you do have to know what you're talking about, but you have to be very good at persuading the judges that you do know what you're talking about. Um, and it is quite a skill, but it's such a lot of fun to do. And it's such a lot of fun to meet other collectors. And it's really enjoyable to travel to ex exhibitions, uh, and we have exhibitions all over the world. Um, and meet other collectors and go out to dinner with them. Stamp collecting is just another way of going out to dinner with your good friend. And more people in international exhibitions speak English than the builders who are building up Church Lane. <laughs> 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 English is the only language that's not spoken to me. Yeah, we had a terrible problem. Had a terrible problem at our Church Lane with the goods lift. It's still not finished, and I think they're still translating the instruction manual into Ukrainian. Okay. <laughs> Let's do that now. <laughs> Today's no, no, they're, they're lovely no, guys. It's, really it's just that the introduction manual doesn't come in Ukrainian. Okay. <laughs> so exhibiting, you know, if you've got to follow those rules, you've got certain um, yeah. regulations to to follow. It takes a lot of time. Do you think it takes a lot of money? There are some people, I'm sure, who look at some of the display of the exhibits here and think. 
this isn't for me, you know, I don't have the budget to buy those rare items. Is it, is it about rarity? The, and I think what I'd s s say is that, uh, first of all, pick your class. Okay. Yeah, if you want to show traditional stuff, just stamps, then the chances of you uh, really getting the very big medals, the large golds internationally, you're not going to get that unless you're prepared to put yeah. money. Mm. However, um, I, I gave the example of uh, not collecting Penny Blacks. Well, I sold my main collection about three years ago now, and I decided I wanted to go back to GB. I haven't collected GB for years. And I looked around and I was fascinated with Perkins Bacon. I thought, well, I'm going to have a go at Penny Blacks. And then I realised I didn't have a spare half million pounds in the bank. So I decided not to do that. But what I did do instead, I collected Perkins Bacon revenues, which are actually in the frames down here. The first time I've ever exhibited that collection, it's a brand new collection, down there, frame 193 if you get more. I haven't actually looked at it myself yet, because I went <laughs> straight, straight here today, but there we go. But what I'm trying to say is that Perkins Bacon revenues are around about 10% the price of Perkins Bacon postage stamps. In, in broad terms. So you can actually go for the the research ability of them, you can look for re-entries, you can look in, in the archives to find uh, how it's all has gone there. There's very few books on the subject. And I just love the challenge of going into a field where nobody else has trodden. Mm. And you can do that on 10% budget than if you're collecting process now. Thematic collecting, open collecting, um, I guess what? Five to ten percent of the, the cost of doing a similar metal equivalent. Graham, would you have an estimate of that? Am I far off? Yeah, I think that's about right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah except. Open, open, open. Yeah. So, Graham, Graham, back to I, Do you know, uh, that's true and it's not true. <laughs> um, there's still a budget of £50,000, which is quite a lot of money. Um, I think that you can get a gold medal for much less than that in yep. some classes. Um, getting a large gold medal is much more expensive, I think, quite often. But I think anybody can aspire to get a gold medal uh, on, a, on a relatively modest budget. You're shaking your head. No, I'm agreeing. Uh, I gave uh, a real example. My Sierra Leone, I was delighted to get an FIP large gold medal. There were five stamps I didn't have. Stanley Gibbons had them in stock at a quarter of a million pounds. And I thought, do I want to go and spend a quarter of a million pounds on those five stuffs I didn't have? And what's the difference that's going to make to my exhibit? What it means is I might get from large gold medal to maybe Grand Prix candidate, but I would never win the big golds. I don't think I'd ever get any further. It I wasn't important. No, no, so what did I do? I sold it. Yeah. Moved on. But, That's great for I mean, I've seen, for example, um, there's a, an exhibit called Jonas Hellström in Sweden, and he very deliberately took a modern subject from the 1970s and tried to do a postal history of a single definitive issue. And I think it cost him uh, under £5,000. Uh, it was very hard to do, because modern postal history is very hard to do. Because most most of the problem is that nobody's ever really collected it. So you've got to find the stuff. Um, but he got a gold medal. Um, he's very costly. He hasn't got a large gold medal because he thinks it's very good. But it's not going to get there. So you, you actually have to choose your subject. And choosing your subject is really important. Um, you shouldn't choose a subject just because you think it's going to get you a medal. You should choose a subject because it's interesting because it interests you, because you like it, uh, because you've got some affinity for it. Because the bottom line in philately is that if it's, if you're doing it in a dutiful sort of way, it really just, you may as well go home and wash the dishes. It's, it's not a lot of fun just to sort of plod through creating something for the sake of a medal. Um, I, I think philately is, is one of the more, in, it's a really, it's a very good pastime for keeping the brain alive, for research, for um, finding other people who share an interest and so on. So it's got a number of great strengths and what, one of the problems with philately, and I'm not answering your question at all, but, <laughs> but one of the problems with philately is that it's, 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 got a, it's managed to get a very bad name over the years, you know. It's, it's all a bit nerdy and of course it's not at all nerdy, uh, in, in my opinion. So, <laughs> 
So we're kind of running out of time. Um, we've got lots more questions, but I wonder if any of any of you have any questions for you guys? Price and large gold medals. I, I think as Mr. Swenson find a topic that you are interested in. I do history is my background, and I have got an exhibit that is something I wanted to do. I wanted to show that story, and 85 points is all it's ever going to get because, in the telling terms, it hasn't got quality of gold. But it's something I want to do, and I think whatever anybody does, find something that you really love doing, you'd like to share with other people because that is just as much that you share that and they appreciate it as it is to get the all the last one. I think the bottom line there, Bitch, is absolutely key. Do what you want to do. Yeah, if you're not enjoying it, why are you bothering? It's great. Right. No, that's really my it's a hobby. Yeah. That's my point. Never lose sight of the fact that it's a hobby. Great. I just asked both of you, and I think I've got a fair idea what the answer might be. Certainly from one of you. What would other people think of the Royal Society? What would they 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 think of the Royal Society? Uh, I'm a fanatical cricket follower, um, as evidenced by this young man here, <laughs> keeps dragging me off to cricket ground. Um, and I also love running up and down mountains, but now I tend to walk up mountains and crawl down. But um, no, they're, they're my other hobbies. Uh, I collect books. I like cartoon books. By cartoon books, I mean books of political cartoons. Um, I collect porcelain with my wife. I collect political porcelain. There's a wonderful British tradition of political porcelain. Um, and uh, political porcelain. Um, well, uh, those of you who are old enough will remember Margaret Thatcher. There was I think a everybody here. Oh, maybe not Isabel. <laughs> there was a. There was a. <laughs> when she was at the height of her powers, um, there was a, there was a Toby jug. And the Toby Jug was a caricature of Margaret Thatcher, and the handle was a knife stabbed into her back, for example. So it's a, it's with blood. It's, it's a splendid thing. <laughs> um, the, the John Major equivalent. That's another. That's a, he's still alive. Um, the, the handle there was a, it was a, it was a, like a key, a proper key for winding him up. You know, because John Major was quite easy to wind up. Um, the People's March for Jobs. Um, the, it's, it's the 200th anniversary of Peterloo. In, in 1819, they made a jug, a water jug, um, to, to condemn the actions of the Manchester Yeomanry. And in, in, there's a piece of creamware which commemorates that. At the same time, the Manchester Yeomanry made another jug with pictures of brave cavalrymen on the outside of it, which commemorated their success in defeating the forces of darkness, revolution, and, uh, re you know, uh, so there was a jug made for that. Um, for the last 250 years, uh, there's been a strand of political activity in Britain, which is, dem which is represented by porcelain, um, and it's still being done today. Uh, I'm absolutely certain that the the Brexit party, you can go and get a half pint mug with what's good about Brexit on the so outside. It's half full or half empty? It'll be half. For me, <laughs> for, for, me for, for, for me, it won't be joining my collection. Would it be 48% for this? <laughs> it'll be, yes, it'll be 48 to 52, I'm down to it. So, so, so that's fine. And we go to the opera, and we go to the theatre, and we travel, and we try to keep, maintain a garden. Well, I'm going out meeting and restaurants and dinner. As I said, philately is just another excuse for going out for dinner with your friends. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Anything else? Any other questions? Five friends. Can you still score 90? Yes. Okay. You can score 95. In theory, you can score 100. I've never seen it, but it's theory is possible. A lady called Eva Moritzson in Prague at an international, oh, ex yes. international exhibition in a five-frame exhibit scored 95 um, last year. A stunning exhibit. It was the first time it was shown. 
first time it was shown. And she's telling the story of um, the King, King Richard Denmark, Christian the Seventh of Denmark, and a, a minister of his called Struenza and his wife. Which they, there was an eternal triangle. There was a child. Struenza was executed. Um, and this, this whole story is made into a movie and uh, Eva tells the story of uh, that, those three people and their eventual... Um, so which class is this, Chris? That's open class. You see, when they say stamp collectors, nearly every stamp collector has got a lot of stuff which isn't stamps. And um, there's a lot more to us than to the hobby, to us and to philately as a whole, than meets the eye. We're just very bad at telling people. <laughs> okay, does that answer your question? Yeah. Certainly possible. Yeah, rare. Rare. It, it, it is a lot of proofs and color trials. And if it, in traditional, yes. In traditional, but not in open. No, in open, she was lucky enough to find the court transcript of the, of the trial of Struenza for treason by sleeping with the king's wife. <laughs> Um, and it was not terribly expensive, but it's a fantastic historical doc document supporting the postal material in her exhibit. It's a great exhibit. Right, great. Thanks both very much. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, as I say, Stan 20, if you'd like to find out a bit more about Stan Collector.